Welcome to the Convest Report, where we sit down with industry experts to discuss the latest developments in the Canadian small cap sector. I'm your host, Arlen Hansen. Standard disclaimer, no part of this interview shall be construed as investment advice. And as I don't know what stocks we're talking about today, I may own shares in the companies or I may be compensated by the companies that we discuss in today's interview. If you find these interviews of value, be sure to join our network, subscribe to our channel, comment in the videos below and share them with like-minded investors. And be sure to join our upcoming conference in middle of September as well. Today, I'm joined by Keith Schaefer, editor and publisher of two subscriber-funded investment newsletters, the Oil and Gas Investment Bulletin and Investing Whisper. Keith has been successfully navigating the junior small cap sector for 30 years, being mostly agnostic to markets, but following the money flow. This guy gets it, folks. He knows how to navigate a bull and bear market better than most newsletters I follow. And I'm super honored to have you on the show today, Keith. Keith, how you doing? Arlen, thanks for having me. I'm doing well. Thank you. <laughs> right on. Well, you've been around this market for a long time, and today I want to discuss longevity in this market. Um, I'm always just so impressed by newsletter writers and investors who can have a long, successful career and do it so consistently. Um, and it's very difficult. Um, but first, uh, tell us how you tell us a little bit more about your newsletters that you're publishing. So the first one we started publishing back in March of 09 was the Oil and Gas Investments Bulletin. And we started that just because shale was really starting to come into its uh, market flow then and uh, became really popular and nobody really understood it. It was something very, very different. And so we set about to basically explain that to retail investors with no words over nine letters and help <laughs> them pick through all the sell side bias that comes with research and uh, pick the best stocks possible. Yeah. And that letter had a great run. Yes. Yes. Uh, obviously, oil and gas became uh, four letter words in the 2010s. <laughs> so we started a, uh, a new newsletter that was had a much broader mandate called the Investing Whisperer. So as you said in the intro, uh, market agnostic, looking at every different sector and really very much a growth focus, looking for uh, uh, not that interested in deep value style stocks where you have to wait forever for mm -hmm. these micro cap and small cap companies to really achieve their potential, but looking at uh, companies with uh, fast rising cash flow, have an audience and uh, can really uh, have already got out of the starting gate successfully, eliminating a lot of risk and can hopefully go the distance and be a, a re real big winner for everyone. So you're looking for torque. Torque and timing <laughs> to a certain degree. Yeah, like, yeah. And I, you talk about longevity. To me, one, one of the things about longevity is you, you have to understand that the cheaper the stock you buy, the longer you have to the wait, way. the more yeah. patient you have to be. And and I've learned as I've got older, I'm not near as patient as I, as I used to be. I know a lot of people do get more patient as they get older. I do not. Interesting. So, so I just have to be aware of that and uh, pick stocks like if you pick a 15, 20 cent stock, you might get a big win in the next two to four years, but you have to be willing to let that sit. And so it's just a lot more fun to watch somebody who's already on their way. Yes. And has, you don't have to wait for milestones for months, uh, you know, that they're, they've got a track record, at least initial track record of achieving something. And so then it's fun. Then, then the game becomes a lot of fun. Yeah, well, it's a lot easier to hold a stock when you're in the money. Yes, right, yes. and in the money, and, and you can see the progress. Yeah, yeah. What do you love about this business? Oh, by far the favorite thing is interviewing these entrepreneurs that are the CEOs, the founders yeah. of these companies. They they all have uh, an amazing story. Uh, they generally uh, don't know how to talk to the market properly. So being public is just a you know a whole bolt on business to what they're used to. So just but just hearing their story of how they got started, what the drive, the passion was behind the creation of whatever it is that they're doing, and uh, hearing about their foibles, their mishaps, uh, their learnings is just as exciting and, and certainly more fun to hear about than their success. So that by far is is the most fun part of the business. I I just love interviewing these guys and women who. Um, you know, ha have a neat story and we help bring that out. You know, the industry sure brings out a lot of characters, right? And th this, this, you know, the A-type 
I'm crazy. I'm wild. I got a great story. I got a great idea. And I'm picking up the phone a hundred times a day to tell it. Right. And you, you sure get a lot of good energy out of those types of CEOs. And like, we've worked with, you know, countless CEOs that have never been public company CEOs before Keith. Right. And the learning curve that these guys have is very steep. You know, I, I do always like to ask them, do you, you don't have any wife or kids at home? Do you, because you, they're, they're not going to see you for the next right. couple of years. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, well, cool. Yeah. Well, I love the business. I love the people in the industry. I love the networking part of it. It's, it's been, a, it's been a lot of fun. And it's also one of those things it's, you don't get tired of it. There's always something new. There's always something new and there's always something to learn. It's kind of like playing golf. You just, you yeah. Never quit. <laughs> you so, never quit. Um, the, you know, so it's not just the CEOs, of course, it's the other investors that you get to talk to. So, uh, Again, go, just going back to your longevity ideas, you know, you have to figure out who you are and where you fit in the market because the market is big enough for everybody. The deep value guys, the momentum guys, big cap, small cap, there is room for everybody. everybody yeah. And so once you've kind of settled into your niche and you're happy there, just talking to all these other investors who have different ideas, uh, different networks, um, kind of plug themselves in at different stages in the same sector. So uh, just listening to them and hearing how they think and process stuff and the questions that they're going to ask management, you go, oh, I, I never thought of that question. That question makes a yeah. lot of sense. So, well, I, of course, all these guys are fun to be around. And, I, and again, when I use the word guys, obviously women, too, there's there's a lot of smart women in our business, of course. So, Yeah. Um, what are uh, some of the biggest changes you've seen over these last 30 years? Like we've seen incredible change. Oh, liquidity is the big thing, right? So uh, when we got in the business in the 90s, uh, anything more than 8 million shares out was vulnerable to a rollback. Wow. Because there was no <laughs> liquidity. The, 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 uh, the investing audience for this microcap sector was incredibly small. Uh, and then, of course, the internet came through and broadened the audience so much. And then as uh, the institution started to come farther and farther downstream, they needed more liquidity. So the floats on these companies, the share floats, became um, much larger. They, these companies were able to raise a lot more money earlier, which wasn't always a good thing. And so uh, you've just seen the whole mechanics of the market in the junior and microcap sector change so much because you have to make room for institutions so much earlier. You you would, you know... Uh, Back in the early mid '90s, you didn't have to make room for institutions until like you were two thirds along the way, and almost kind of picked out who was going to buy you out. Mm -hmm. So uh, dealing with that has been a quite a shift. Also, particularly in the last, I'd say seven to ten years, the promoters behind a lot of these companies are um, they're giving themselves a lot of very cheap stock, big blocks of cheap stock, way more than usual. So a lot of times these companies come out with, you know, 80 to 150 million shares out, out of the gate to start. Mm -hmm. That's uh, got no more than a nickel and is usually under a penny. So figuring that out, figuring out share structure, like once a company gets to two bucks, let's say, the business has had to get along far enough that structure isn't so important. But uh, in the early days, the first couple of years, share structure is almost more important than the business. You, oh. you, you, you need to know who the shareholders are. are. Are they generally got a reputation for selling early? Do they really build businesses? There's just, and, and then the other thing that goes along with that is that these guys with the internet now, they're able to promote these stocks online into Europe and- All, uh, Everywhere around the globe. A, anywhere around the globe. So- <laughs> Yeah. It's just that they have, the promoters have become incredibly smart about creating big blocks of cheap paper for themselves and figuring out ways to distribute it. So you really have to pay attention here. Again, who owns the stock? Where did it go? The big blocks. I'm, I'm always asking the question, okay, of, of all that escrow stock, uh, who got it? What have those people done in the past? What's their track record? It's not just management. Because right. oftentimes there's such big blocks of this stock that you you got you have to be aware who owns it. So uh, one um, huge one huge block and of an investor going through a divorce. Yes, yes, yeah, you right. Like it just, that. Yep. it it happens, right? There's a million reasons why someone's selling your stock. There's only one reason to buy. 
Um, so, so I think one of the biggest changes we've seen over the last 10 years, and I mirror a lot what you say, but is also how the transactions are happening in the retail market, right? Like, I don't feel that when you look at these firms, like the brokers, the institutions, the bankers, the analysts, they all work together anymore. I feel like they're all siloed. So I remember 20 years ago, you'd get a bank behind your deal and you'd get their whole retail crowd. You'd get their institutional, you'll get your analysts behind it. You just don't see that anymore. Like until those companies are much bigger, right? So we're not getting that support from the banks like earlier on, um, like to get the whole weight behind the bank, behind the company. It's just, it's just it's so rare. Yeah, and that's a good thing to bring up. So why is that? And, and of course, uh, the obvious answer that comes to me is, you know, uh, very few people know how to put a team together for a project now. You yeah. know, you, you've got um, in the early days of a company where, again, management just gets a little too concentrated on their own net worth, perhaps, uh, mm -hmm. and doesn't know how to really build the team. Because once the street sees an outsized position like that, it, it you know, you, you got to work with the street. And and so what the, the situation that you just talked to me about was a kind of an indication to me that a lot of these teams don't understand how to put the right team, team together. together. Yeah. Interesting. Um, speaking of management, like if you're looking, would you rather have an A class management with a B class asset or an, an A class asset with a B class management? Oh no. A class management. For always, sure. always, always, like, always, always, always. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the A class team will figure out a way to get an A class asset. They will. Yeah, totally. Or fix. So, or fix something that's broken or you know. I, I can't remember whose line it is, but that basically they said something like when stupid management means great assets, stupid management always wins. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's going lower. So. Yep. Every time, every time. Um, so we talked a little bit about the struggles with the Canadian liquidity. Um, I know you're not necessarily like you're very agnostic in your approach and your money flow, but uh, you know, we're a commodities focused show mostly. What's your general thoughts about commodities right now across the board? Commodities are in a tough spot. You know, uh, inflation is really hurting, uh, increasing costs for these guys. So for the producers in any commodity, costs have been going up a lot in the last two, three years. So, you know, net cash flows for these guys uh, has been very difficult. And of course, the U.S. dollar has been really high. So, you know, commodities generally do poorly in that type of environment. Um, so, and, and, and we've had... Um, you know, with all the stimulus here, um, we're, we're in that hangover period now. Everybody bought all kinds of things and copper and oil and all the cyclicals did so well. But now we're kind of like, OK, everybody bought a lot of stuff and maybe you don't need as much stuff. The oil demand is still pretty strong. But um, I'm trying to think of a commodity where there's a real shortage. And, and, and I think one of the, the problems here that we've got is that you look at all the inventories, particularly on the base metals and even in oil, where inventories are quite low, historically speaking, and yet prices haven't really gone up that much. And, and so I see that and then I question my own thinking like, OK, but costs have come down uh, a little bit with technology. So, you know, just as an example, oil has a new fracking uh, method right now called the fishbone that is increasing oil production, you know, 12 years after shale really got popular, increasing production flow by 55% in some of these oil wells where wow. the costs are only up maybe 10%. So that's huge. And, and so you're just seeing maybe technology really is lowering costs more than we think that, uh, but, but to me, it's always been a bit of an enigma for the last year and a half that, Inventories, nickel, copper, oil are pretty low. Yeah. And prices really haven't gone up that much. Yeah. So um, uh, we're not long a lot of commodities right now. You know, we, we've probably been too defensively positioned over the last year and a half waiting for the recession that never came. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, at, at the same time, the stocks really haven't done anything either. So perfect example would be oil, uh, where we sold everything out last March and of 22. And basically, other than a quick spike up in July of 22, that's been the right call because 
Oil stocks have not broken out. Oil has not broken out. It's trading. It's all trading at the top of its range now. But th there just seems to be less interest institutionally and retail in commodities now than before. So Jared, I'm not 100% sure why that is. I, yeah. I guess you could argue it's demographics. Maybe the the new investors are way more tech heavy. And that, this could be a whole generation thing that we have to go through. I don't know. Uh, I just read a report that some sort of gold ETF in the States, the majority of their shareholders are actually millennials. Well, cha, cha, cha. I was, I was floored. I didn't think that a millennial knew what precious metals were, to be quite honest. <laughs> uh, so Keith, how do you stay disciplined in this market, right? Like you said, you sold all your oil stocks a year and a half ago. I guess patience is probably like the most valuable asset on the books right now. Well, actually, the, 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 it's been a really tough junior market for a year and a half now, like really tough. So discipline now is easy. When discipline is hard is in, in 2020 and 2021, when things are flying. And uh, I, I confess, Arlen, I, I should have had a lot more discipline then. Yeah. When you uh, are able to take advantage of a good market, all your friends say, oh, put a little bit of money here. Put a little, I, we got this one. Oh, we want to get you in here and all that. And so... That's when you really, really have to have uh, discipline. Right now, it's pretty easy to say no to everything that comes your way because... Um, and you probably shouldn't be saying no at this time. Uh, yeah, I, I think, again, you just need to be discerning. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I think one of the big lessons here in, in a market like this, where there's a lot of early stage projects still coming around, whether it's businesses or resources, um, the inside team has to fund that a lot farther along than what they've had to in a good market. And so if if the inside team isn't in for it for seven figures uh, and as a group eight figures sometimes, you really got to wonder about how long, how long this is going to take. So having mm -hmm. big sponsorship in a market like this is so important. You want to know that the team behind the deal has had a win before, has has been able to ideally get uh, their previous ventures up to a, a stock price over $2, and hopefully the business has followed suit. And so that's kind of really important now is uh, in a market like this, finding the right teams to support. Yeah, yeah. Um, while we're talking about that, do you want to rattle off some names that you either talk about in your letter or however you want to approach that? I don't know if you want to give your secret sauce to everybody here, but no, no, no. Look, look, um, I, I think again, it, it comes down to team structure and catalyst. And in, in, in a market like this, you want something that have that has you know relatively imminent catalyst. And, and even that isn't always making a difference. Um we follow a lot of biotechs because uh, they're very liquid. Uh, they're high risk, high reward. You can get uh, multi-baggers in a very short period of time on one decision. Uh, so just as an example, we had a, a junior biotech listed in the States called Delcat, DCTH. They got their product approved uh, and the stock really did nothing. Like wow. it traded, traded up. Okay, so it, it traded a hundred million shares that day at five bucks <laughs> on wow. a stock that only has 30 million out, uh, oh my God. but it didn't go anywhere. Uh, and then you look at some of the drill holes in, in the resource sector uh, that are coming out and it, they don't mean anything. Well, not all of them. Sometimes Except Snowline, they're killing it. Yeah. Yeah. So again, you look at uh, Quentin Hennep, who's kind of one of the main architects of that deal. I don't know that he's part of management, but, but the point is that that Crescat is a good sponsor. Their deals work. So yeah. uh, you want to follow what they're doing. Um, another group that we follow is Power One out of Toronto, Pat and Dave. So they, they've they got this full circle lithium, FCLI, that uh, the management team is from Neo Lithium that was bought out for six and a half bucks. Yeah. Uh, our subscribers made a schwack of money on that. We were buying it at 50, 60 cents. And so, you know, they, that that deal just went public. It's got some catalysts coming here, September, October, with its uh, lithium recycling uh, plant that should be in uh, production within the next 60 days uh, down in Atlanta. So that's a catalyst. So they've got the sponsorship, the share structure, and the team and the idea with an immediate catalyst that says, if they hit what they're doing, stock should actually have a very powerful move. So that, that's the kind of 
things you're looking for. You, um, finding a, a a really good asset with a team that doesn't have a track record is not going to work in this market. Pretty tough. Yeah. Because they need to tap on their network for money. Yeah. Right? And if you just don't have the network, you're, you're doomed right now in this game. Yeah. That's awesome. Keith, um, how can my listeners find out more about your, your letters? Well, uh, so Investing Whisper is the one that we really focus on right now. And we, if, if there is a great oil story that we like, we'll absolutely include it in the Investing Whisperer. And so just at investingwhisperer.com, uh, I'm lucky that I had a, a very large Twitter following with oil and gas. So I actually have just kept my oil and gas handle oil and gas invest on Twitter, even though we uh, talk about everything under the sun. Today, we had a big story out on one of the fastest growing tech companies I've seen in years called Pagaya down in the States. Uh, so we did a, a a pretty detailed story on that one. So yeah. And, and what's the symbol on that one? PGY on the NASDAQ. PGY. So you're you're covering some of the the US deals too and things like oh, that. I guess that's just where liquidity is, right? We have to. You know, yeah. the Canadian stories right now, they're not attracting institutional interest, uh, even retail interest. So you you like you talked right when we started here, you need to follow the money flow and Canadian juniors they're rare as hen's teeth. Uh mm -hmm. you've got to be willing to own a very illiquid stock with a great business and have absolute conviction. Period. Yes, which means you have to have the stomach to watch it go down. <laughs> Almost every time. Um, Keith, thanks so much for your time, buddy. Always a always a great time chatting with you. Uh, we've known each other for a very long time. You you were one of my mentors in my business, so I do want to thank you for many many years in my career that I that I learned under your tutelage. So uh, God bless you, buddy. Arlen, you're um, always a joy to talk to. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll chat again. Okay, cheers. See you. Yeah, bye bye.